Gatsby JS is a framework for building web applications for JavaScript. Gatsby's original goal was to allow users to create super fast static websites that could be hosted and served efficiently at a low cost. Most web pages have components from a framework like React or Angular that need to render after the user requests the page. This rendering can sometimes require additional requests to external data sources, causing the page to take even longer to load. Gatsby uses GraphQL to pull in data at build time and pre-render as much of a site as possible using React's server-side rendering. When a page is built with Gatsby and it's served to a user, as much of the page has been rendered as possible so that the browser can quickly load everything on the page without additional network requests. And if this is confusing, don't worry, we get into it in this episode. Kyle Matthews is the creator of Gatsby JS, and he joins the show to describe why he created Gatsby, the high-level goals, and the low-level engineering decisions. We also discuss how Kyle intends to take Gatsby beyond just an open source project and turn it into a business. I enjoyed this episode a lot because Kyle has a very long-term outlook for how to build his open source project into a business, and it's fascinating to hear it. Developers love Docker containers because they give applications portability and consistency all the way from your laptop to production. But things can get complicated fast when the time comes to deploy, manage, scale, and secure containerized apps in the cloud. Amazon EC2 Container Service from Amazon Web Services makes it easy to run Docker apps in production. With Amazon EC2 Container Service, installing, updating, operating, and scaling your infrastructure happens automatically. Using simple API calls, you can launch and stop Docker-enabled applications, query the state of your cluster, and natively integrate with powerful AWS services like security groups, elastic load balancing, EBS volumes, and more. Best of all, you only pay for the AWS compute and storage resources you use. With Amazon EC2 Container Service, you can focus on building apps, not spending time deploying, scaling, and managing your container infrastructure. It's time to get back to what you do best. Learn more about Amazon EC2 Container Service at ecs.aws today. That's the letters ecs.aws. Matthews is an open source web consultant. He works on Gatsby JS. Kyle, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Hey, glad to be here. So we'll get into what Gatsby is and why you started working on it, but I'd like to give a little bit of context and get your perspective for how you see the world of JavaScript. So explain how you see the world of JavaScript tooling today. What are people using? Why are they using it? And just any subjective observations you have. I love meta questions, so let's go right to meta. So, yeah, I mean, why people use JavaScript? I mean, first and foremost, because you have to. <laughs> that, of course, is changing with, you know, ASM, the web ASM stuff, WebAssembly stuff. But in the meantime, yeah, it's kind of the only game in town when you're doing for the web. And the web is the biggest application platform out there. So lots and lots of people write JavaScript. And, yeah, and so I, I think that is really the cause of, like, just all the craziness, just that, you know, the internet is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's just literally trillions of dollars at stake. And a lot of it is resting on the somewhat thin shoulders of, you know, the JavaScript ecosystem. And so that means, you know, there's lots of people who are paid lots of money to have opinions about stuff and to build tools in it. And there's just a lot of pressure to, you know, make things better as quickly as possible, which makes for a very you know, chaotic and fast paced ride, you know? So like you think like you're going rafting or something like that and you're going around through, you know, these big fat rapids. And anyway, so I think the chaos is kind of inevitable, but you know, it kind of, kind of comes with the territory. Yeah. And somebody new who's getting started with JavaScript today, I think they have to spend an alarming amount of time learning these different tools. And maybe 10 years ago, 
I guess maybe nine years ago, people could just do Rails new and you get started with a Rails framework and you know, you're off to the races and you're kind of up to the standards of how people are getting started with web apps. Mm-hmm. That's that's just not the case today. There's there's so much no. more learning to be done. There's so much complexity. How did we get so far from the good old days of the web where you just, <laughs> you know, slap some JavaScript together, you got a few command line you know, a few command line arguments to get a Rails app up and running, or, you know, you just slap together some bare bones JavaScript. How did we get from there to where we are today? I think simply put, it's just, there's much higher standards now. If you look at an old Rails app, I mean, they're pretty simple, really, versus now, I mean, it's just too, too, the the internet is like, it's a winner take all environment, you know, like Facebook is far and away, you know, gets the money for being, you know, the best social network on the internet. And, you know, there's lots of other tools that where it's kind of a winner take all environment. So there, there's, there's no rewards from being sort of good. It's like you win as a business, you win as a product, you win as a whatever on the internet because you're the best anyway. So it it just leads to dynamic where being kind of good, being like following like quote unquote best practice doesn't get you much. Like you have to be pushing the envelope in whatever, you know, direction makes sense for what you're working on to, to, to be the best. And so anyway, so it just means that if you're kind of a newbie into the environment, you know, there's some like punishingly high standards for doing things that combined with the fact that, you know, everything's just evolving so quickly that, you know, it's like what worked a year ago doesn't necessarily make sense anymore. And so kind of like, kind of, kind of the two, like the punishingly high standards to be successful on the web. And, you know, the rapid pace of evolution makes it a very kind of like tricky environment mm. to jump into. Mm. I mean, if, if you're, if you're, if you're learning how to swim, you want to jump into a nice, you know, still part of the river, not into the, you know, the rapids, but everyone kind of has to learn to swim by jumping in the rapids and, you know, well, swimming off. In, in what you mentioned about the winner take all environment, that doesn't just apply to applications it also applies to open source tools which i think we're seeing oh, yeah, with, with with react there's just just such gravity towards the react ecosystem today and it's really sucking all the oxygen out of the room as far as i can tell i mean there are people who you know view is taking off i think to some degree people mm-hmm. are in the ember community are still active angular community is still active but relative to react you know it, it, i think it's a similar story with on the back end with uh, kind of kubernetes versus whatever other orchestration framework you're talking about. But let's talk about the front end. React specifically, why has it sucked all the oxygen out of the room? Why is there so much momentum behind that project? And I guess the adjoining Facebook technologies as well. Yeah. Well, I think first and foremost, it's like, this is a pattern that shows up over and over again. And, you know, all sorts of different types of ecosystems similar to this, you know, programming and, and otherwise, where you have like a, a, a marketplace for some sort of thing and you have lots of players competing, you know, for share in that marketplace. And, you know, assuming there's not some sort of distortion, it, it, it quite often ends up being like the first place, first place product tool, whatever gets like 80% of the market share, you know, second place gets like 10, 15%. And then, you know, third place gets 5%. And then there's kind of a long tail, you know, that have like some percentage of 1% or whatever. I mean, that shows up in, you know, the rental car, you know, and, you know, streaming, movie streaming and I don't know, any any sort of marketplace you can think of, open source and not open source and all sorts of different businesses. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so I think that's what's happening with, you know, the front end tooling is that, you know, React is kind of settling into first place. And then, you know, the, it's still, it's, it's still... You know, a lot of things are unsettled. You must have some. You, I mean, you must have some thesis around the the technical reasons for why it it gained so much gra- gravity. Even if that you know gravity led to some momentum, and now that's self perpetuating. But you know, is there? I mean, I would I would have expected something like, oh, the declarative syntax or the <laughs> one the one way well, data binding or something like that. Uh, I don't know. I've been around too long to believe that you know, like things win because they're the best necessarily. That's, that's, hmm. you know, that's not. So you think good PR? You essentially think good PR? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's lots of things. I mean, I mean, well, first and foremost, I do think React is, like, excellent technically. But I don't know that it's, like, 
as best as it possibly can be, but it's quite good. So, so that's like, that's first and foremost, like it does, it does, you know, have a lot of advantage just on its own merits, ignoring anything else. I think, I think it has like, something I think a lot about is just like the open, like the business model around open source. Cause like, you know, there's, there's kind of this perception that open source comes from like magic internet fairies, you know, and like, it just shows up on, on, on a GitHub page near you and you're like, oh sweet, this solves all my problems. And then you don't really think about it again, but you know, in reality, there's like real people. <laughs> I, I have lots of evidence of that. There's real people behind open source and they have like real reasons for doing it. And the best projects almost always have like some sort of like real business model around it that like sustains the amount of investment in them to like get to a point that they're like really good. And so it's interesting to see like there's lots of big tech companies and lots of them for one reason or another open source things. And it's been really interesting for me over the years just to like watch like you know, why I do some projects, try to figure out like why I do some projects succeed and others don't. And I think a big part of it is just, does the long-term interest of the company towards the open source project, you know, line up closely enough with long-term interest of people mm. using it? Well, yeah, I mean, so, so React, certainly Facebook has more skin in the game with the technology that's used to build user-facing components yeah. than... I would argue then Google has in the game for building user facing components and and you know cuz like you think you just follow the money right like search yeah, adver- <laughs> exactly, search, yeah. search advertising is not the most beautiful UI experience but it gets the job done it brings in the right. money and and that's maybe you know the, that lack of skin in the game perhaps uh, undermined Google's efforts to really get the you know the the JavaScript framework du jour, and that's you know that's kind of what led to like a, a kind of conf- market confusion around okay so Angular two or web components or what's going mm-hmm. on here like what am I supposed to be using, and React just kind of like stole the thunder. Yeah, yeah, and there's two there's two kind of like negative effects from like misalignment like that because like first it doesn't lead to the right technical decisions sometimes because you know the lack of skin in the game leads people to engineers to doing i mean engineers like we like to think of ourselves as like smart and you know strategic and this that and the other thing but you know given no constraints we'll happily you know waste you know do all sorts of like silly things that don't necessarily make sense but there's kind of common criticism you know, the angler especially the early anglers they try to do too much and where anyways where, where facebook's like very focused uh, on like how they do react because they're like hey like we're just like this one small team supporting like this 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 part this component and like the rest of the, the rest of the company has to make you know decisions around it and so on and so forth anyways so the lack of alignment can lead to technical decisions that are perhaps less than optimal but also it causes a lot of mistrust in the community because not everyone you know realizes this sort of like follows this kind of stuff but a lot of people are clued into these sort of things and so you know if you're making a big decision on whether to go to react or angular you know using those two as an example you're going to have a lot more trust in, you know, the long-term viability of React than Angular. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I think that right. totally is how things have played out. I, I think we've set the stage appropriately for some of your beliefs, and maybe we can tie those in a little bit later on, but I want to get to Gatsby. Mm-hmm. And so I look at Gatsby, I was fairly new to it until I started researching it for this interview. I've certainly never worked with it, but from hearing your comments, it sounds like the goal of Gatsby has either it's always been to become a nice, nice full fledged web framework that works for the modern web. It's either that's always been the goal or you started with this, this static site generator and then you kind of realized, Oh, this is actually a nice beachhead. And then maybe we can, we can pivot or I don't know, not pivot, but advance that that beachhead of building a static website generator into a full fledged web framework. So I'd like to be to, to kind of understand your strategy or or your story, the story arc that you're mm-hmm. that you're laying out here. But I guess you know maybe we could start with just explaining why a static website generator is useful. Why you started building a static website generator? Why people actually adopted it? Yeah, so I mean, static sites are nice because they're just really simple. Maybe you could define what a static website is for people who are who are kind of uh, unsure of that term. Uh, sure. Yeah. So I mean, you know, when when you access a website, 
I mean, what what's actually going on under the hood is your computer, whether that's like a laptop, desktop, or mobile smartphone, whatever. You know, it sends like a, an HTTP request over the internet, gets routed somewhere, and you say, "I want this HTML page," and then that server somehow generates HTML, you know, a big string, and like sends it back to you. And then your browser then like, you know, looks through and says, oh, there's all these other things that I need. And then says, goes back and says, hey, get me these things too. And then those come back. And then your browser says, sweet, I got everything I need to, you know, put pixels on the screen. And then it does that. And there are, for such a simple thing, there's like an enormous <laughs> number of ways that that, you know, process can happen. But, you know, you can kind of like divide them into two camps. There's like camp one is when the browser sends a request for, you know, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, whatever, you know, the server there does work to come up with things, to generate those things. And kind of the other camp is everything is like pre-built. And so whatever you could possibly request when you're like browsing around a site, those things already exist. And the server just like, you know, reads them off the disk and sends it back to you. And so the first category is like loosely defined as like dynamic websites. Um, and typically, you know, they have like running code and like databases. And so you like hit a page and it says, oh, this is like Bob that's like requesting stuff. And so I'm going to like do a query and get everything that Bob needs to see and send it back to him. And anyways, and so in the second category where everything is like pre-built and, and just sitting as files on a server, those are called like static sites. And not necessarily because, you know, the website itself is static, but, you know, because the the process for like, kind of the end process of like, you know, deploying things for that site it, like, is, is like static files. So they're called static sites. And uh, anyways, and so the, 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 there's lots of implications from this, but one, one of the big reasons that people like static sites is it's just so simple to run them instead of like having to monitor, you know, running applications sitting on a server, you know, responding to people's requests and like, you know, big databases with lots of data and all, you know, like, you know, having databases get overrun by too many requests or, you know, anyways, there's all sorts of like complexities that come with running a dynamic site, like solvable because lots of people do it. But when you look at a static site where you just like, basically, there's actually lots of like static height site hosting services these days. And all you have to do is generate the site and hand off the files to them. And then basically, you know, everyone on the internet could visit you and there wouldn't be a problem. That, that kind of like peace of mind simplicity that like your site's going to be fast and, you know, up regardless of what happens is, is quite reassuring. Are you talking uh, about like the square spaces of the world? No, there, there's several companies like Netlify is one that's gotten a lot of traction. Oh. GitHub pages, you know, Amazon S3. There's lots of places where you can just like stick files and then point internet traffic at them and then they'll handle serving traffic for you. Spring Framework gives developers an environment for building cloud-native projects. On December 4th through 7th, Spring One Platform is coming to San Francisco. Spring One Platform is a conference where developers congregate to explore the latest technologies in the Spring ecosystem and beyond. Speakers at Spring One Platform include Eric Brewer, who created the Cap Theorem, Vaughn Vernon, who writes extensively about domain-driven design, and many thought leaders in the Spring ecosystem. Spring One Platform is the premier conference for those who build, deploy, and run cloud-native software. Software Engineering Daily listeners can sign up with the discount code SEDAILY100 and receive $100 off of a Spring One Platform conference pass while also supporting Software Engineering Daily. I will also be at Spring One reporting on developments in the cloud-native ecosystem. I would love to see you there and have a discussion with you. Join me December 4th through 7th at the Spring One Platform Conference and use discount code SEDAILY100 for $100 off of your conference pass. That's SEDAILY100, all one word for the promo code. Thanks to Pivotal for organizing Spring One Platform and for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. You're talking about the hosting providers that people who, for example, build a static website with Gatsby could throw their website on. Yeah, and not just Gatsby. I mean, all the other static site generators out there. 
anyways, and so that's 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 kind of like a very that's very kind of reassuring. And like when you have lots of other stuff going on, like that's it's nice to take you know ten twenty percent of you know your workload off you, uh, so you can focus on other things if you can. Mm -hmm. And also, it's just uh, they're much faster. You know, it's like dynamic sites. Like I was saying, like you have to do work every time there's a request, and that work takes time. You know, very fast dynamic sites. You know, can be on the order of like fifty hundred milliseconds. But you know, oftentimes, especially if you're uh, like under uh, a lot of traffic, you know, you can like start looking at you know latency times of three hundred, five hundred, seven hundred fifty milliseconds, which just leaves mm -hmm. your site feeling slower. What well, one thing I feel I, I I just don't understand properly. You know, you could serve static versions of lots of different websites that are commonly thought of as dynamic. Like I could freeze Instagram in time and serve it as a static website. Can you shed a little more light on the gradient between static and dynamic websites? Like, or or maybe you don't see it as a gradient. If 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 you see a, some fine delineating point, then kind of emphasize that delineation. Yeah, it's pretty blurry because. Even like quote unquote dynamic websites, they almost always have you know a lot of like pre-built assets that they're serving, you know whether it's images or JavaScript or CSS that they're not doing you know, like I was saying work you know on each request. And then of course static websites, oftentimes I mean especially with Gatsby of course since it's like running React, you know you can be hitting APIs and you know kind of like pulling in all sorts of dynamic data and like dynamically generating stuff on the client. And so, yeah, so in practice, you could very easily build Instagram as a static site. Uh, you would just need an API to, to, to fetch, you know, like, you know, you, you open the front page and say, oh, hey, like, this is the latest post from your buddies, your friends, and so forth, and then dynamically generate that. Okay, well, give a little more color on how you see the, the goals of Gatsby, because, I, I, like I said, I understand that, you know, it started off as a static site generator, but... I know you want to build it into what you would consider a web framework. Was that the goal mm -hmm. all along? Not at all. I mean, yeah. So when I started working on Gatsby, it was, I was working on a startup at the time and we were far enough along that we needed a website and we were building, you know, I've been working in React at that point for like a year or so and building, of course, everything for the startup in React. And I was just like really, really impressed with just the the whole experience around using React and also Webpack and you know kind of some Babel and other associated kind of like modern JavaScript CSS tooling and I was like I don't want I, I mean I, I want these this the same experience these same tools for building our website and also I had like my blog and you know of course you just as, as a programmer you're just always ending up building random websites so it's like like I'd really love to be able to build websites with these tools. And I'd already done, you know, some static site stuff, and I was, like, sold on the benefits of that. So I was like, okay, how do I build kind of a React, Webpack, Babel, et cetera, tool that makes it pretty straightforward to build, you know, websites with React components? And then for funsies, you know, throw in Markdown and JSON and YAML support and some other stuff. And so it, it was just kind of like a thing, kind of like a, a little problem, you know, sitting at the back of my mind for a while. And eventually, just like piece by piece, that you know things fell together. I was like, okay, do this way, this way, whatever. And then you know, anyways. And then like it, it kind of like came to a point. Where I was like, okay, we really need a website. And I've kind of like figured everything out more or less. And so I'm just going to take some time off from startup work and you know spit out the the first version, get 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 a, get a working version out. Um, and so I did that like over a week, like two like kind of summer 2015, and then open source that. Anyways, and so that was the start of Gatsby. And I mean, at the time, I, I mean, I, I've worked in, I mean, I've been doing web stuff for a while, for like 10 years or whatever. And I actually like cut my teeth in programming in the Drupal world. So I spent like several years there. And then I worked at Pantheon, which is a, at the time is Drupal, but now also does like WordPress hosting and like a lot of developer tools. And so, you know, spent a couple years kind of doing front engineering, project management there, product management there. So like very familiar with like the needs of people, you know, agencies building websites. And uh, anyway, so I, I definitely knew that like Gatsby had a lot of potential. But when I first started, it was like, well, anyways, this would be a fun tool and I'll use it. And other people might like it too, whatever. But I got a startup and I'm trying to make it successful. And so I open sourced it. And it kind of fairly quickly, uh, you know, got a lot of attention and 
people started using it for stuff because people have been talking about like, oh, React is awesome. Wouldn't it be cool if we do like, uh, I mean, because React's ability to, you know, render on the server was something that really differentiated it when it launched. And so a lot of people are like, oh, like, what if we could build static sites with React? And But I think Gatsby was one of the very first to really like kind of package that into something that was, you know, straightforward to use. That's server side, sorry to interrupt you, but that's server side rendering, uh, just in case people don't know what that is and, and why that's important, you know, uh, pre-React, the stuff like Angular and Backbone, you would send all the code to the user and they their browser would have to render the, the, the components, basically parse and render the components into stuff that the page could render and i guess there was more additional requests often additional requests involved in that so it could you could often slow down your page if you're using backbone or angular uh but with react you know if you render it on the server on the server side then you just get more snappy responsive websites i guess you you can correct me if i if i uh, didn't answer if i didn't define that correctly no no that's spot on yeah and i was actually at pantheon i did backbone um uh, development and you know we we were just like a, a saas app so we didn't really care so much about you know the, the initial time to paint but there are other people that did and they were using backbone and like did these incredible feats of engineering to get backbone to be able to render on the server you know to respond to request but yeah like react was like remarkable in that there was no weird you know crazy hacks that you had to do it was actually really straightforward to fairly straightforward anyways to get server rendering working which made it really amenable to something like gatsby where you could you know, server render your web application, your JavaScript, you know, stuff, and then quickly rehydrate that once it gets into the into the browser. So anyway, so yeah, so I open sourced it, you know, about two years ago, and uh, you know, got Hacker News and like, you know, a lot of buzz on Twitter, and people started using it to build stuff. And so I was like, cool. <laughs> actually, those are the, actually those are, I think my first open source project that ever really took off in any degree. So I was like, hey, this is fun. I built something that I needed, and other people like it too. Fun, fun, fun. But anyways, back to startup stuff. But then like a year later or so, well, actually, so I spoke seven, eight months after that, I spoke at the React, con- like the second React conference on Gatsby. And that was kind of opening too, because I hadn't realized quite how many people had seen Gatsby. Cause like before and after my talk, you know, lots of people were coming to me. was like, oh, you did Gatsby, Gatsby's so cool. And I was like, oh wow, like Gatsby's <laughs> got a lot more traction than I thought. <laughs> so that was fun. And anyways, and then about that time also, like the startup wasn't doing that great. And so I started thinking about, okay, like if I quit, you know, what I'm going to do next and started thinking more seriously about like, you know, what could Gatsby be? And also just like, what is the state of the web world and, you know, where's it going and all that jazz. And so anyways, by the time I decided to quit, I was also pretty certain that like, I thought, you know, putting some full-time work into Gatsby made a lot of sense you know, hmm. to turn into something a lot more than what it is, you know, the first version was. And uh, anyway, so that's what I did. So last, last summerish or so, like last July, August or whatever, I started work. you know, I started, you know, putting in some serious time thinking about what Gatsby should become and, hmm. you know, wrote up a bunch of plans and whatever and started working towards that. Because your, your architecture is pretty unique and it like it has the marks of somebody who really thought deeply about what they wanted to do with it. Yeah. No, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, before I wrote any code for the new version of Gatsby, I probably spent, because I've been thinking about it. It was funny, too, because, like, all the time I was working on the startup, like, I, I kept having more ideas for Gatsby, but didn't have any time to, like, implement anything. And so I just kind of, like, queued up, like, months and months of thinking about what Gatsby should be. And so I, I never actually really had thought that thoroughly about something before coding. Normally, like, I think for a while, then I'm like, okay, anyways, I'm bored. So then I start coding something. And so it's actually really funny because, like, the first, like, few months of working on uh, Gatsby V1 was just, like, incredibly productive because, like, I, I just, like, thought over and over about how stuff would work. And it was just, like, the code just, like, flew out. Which is something I think is kind of interesting because I, I think that's uh, reflective of – there was a period of time, I think, where – Silicon Valley or build the building stuff community maybe over indexed on the idea of just kind of like throw something together like eh, you're, you'll figure it out as you go along lean startup mm-hmm. and optimize for the local maxima and then something has changed I I, th- I think it may be the preponderance of, of resources available the preponderance of money really cheap web hosting where you actually can afford to think longer term uh, mm-hmm. or maybe you could afford to think longer term 
all the time. I mean, look at Bezos. But yeah. you know, certainly, <laughs> I I have found that that the the projects that actually succeed for me are the ones that have a longer term mentality because the shorter term ones. If you're looking at shorter term mentality projects, you're asking to get out competed by somebody that's just like a faster programmer or you know is better at sort of like adapting to the gestalt of the modern developer community. But if you if you really think longer term, then it it, it sets you up for a more defensible position. Yeah, I would say <laughs> this is an incredibly complex question <laughs> you know like why, why do you really why, question I, I was just i was well, just making a comment and looking for a response yeah i mean just like just, well i mean okay the the underlying question is like why you know why why are, why are some things successful and others aren't i mean to that i would say it's like very complex and, and well like why are some things successful and what things not and like what kind of development product strategies you know best lead to success anyways it, it's 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 actually not very yeah i don't know I, I think there's room for all sorts of strategies and different you know strategies yeah. work at different times totally and there's like also leads in you know the personality of the people doing it because like some people just flat out can't do you know like deep strategic thought it's just not them and like mm-hmm. i don't think you know i don't think they should be like well, you can't ever be successful because you can't, you know, right. strategically. I think there's, I think there's, I think there's a place for people who just, you know, you know, a little like kind of like spastically jump <laughs> into stuff. Because like oftentimes, you know, they, you know, they kind of like stumble upon things that you know slower, more strategic people don't necessarily, you know, come across. A- anyways, the thing <laughs> is, like, the thing is, I think it's like, like I think it all works out if you think of it as kind of like how is the ecosystem as a whole progressing because. You know, you kind of have these natural prototypers who are just, you know, relentlessly trying one idea after another, and they produce, you know, a lot of interesting ideas, but not necessarily production quality code. And then you have, you know, kind of like, perhaps, perhaps I fall into the second camp. I'm not entirely sure. Anyways, you know, maybe people who are more strategic about it, and they pensive. kind of like pensive. <laughs> How are you going to describe it? And, and kind of like pull things together in a more easy to use package or something. Anyways, I, I think it's like. You know, we're all kind of working on this together, and it's like different people have different strengths, and I think if we, you know, build off each other's yeah. strengths, then it all works out. Much Agreed. <clears throat> Agreed. So let's come back to Earth and talk a little bit about <laughs> what Gatsby actually is, why it's different, and why it's interesting. You describe the future as JavaScript, APIs, and mobile, the Jam stack. And uh, I think, you know, part of the motivation for how you have this architecture set up basically the and i guess i should i was gonna say the part the part i find the most interesting is the fact that you have graphql working at build time to pull in data and maybe maybe we should just emphasize that and because i find that the most interesting engineering decision or i and this is coming from somebody who hasn't looked at your project very much so it may not be but maybe you could explain why graphql and I think there are some people out there who who probably still don't know what GraphQL is. I think it's a really interesting technology people should look into if you don't know about it. But explain what GraphQL is. Explain why it's useful and how it fits into the build process for a static website generator. Okay. So GraphQL first is a... You can basically think of it as query language for a database that you build yourself. Is kind of how I think about it. So it's actually very, it's, it's, it's fairly similar to like SQL, you know, the most common declarative query language out there in the sense that, you know, you say, I want data. And then, you know, in SQL, it's like there's a database that then gives you data. So you say, I want data and data comes back. And GraphQL is like identical in that you say, here's my query. I, I declare that I want this data and then data comes back. But the difference is, is that with SQL, you know, you define tables and or collections or whatever you know and you like put data in it and then it you know and then the database is this like complex piece of software engineering which then you know does all sorts of optimizations around you know turning returning data to you quickly and so forth where graphql is kind of like and it i mean so 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 kind of set the scene it's like where it came out of was you know facebook i mean facebook developed graphql and they started developing it a few years ago when they first started building their 
they, they switched to like native for their apps for their you know Android and iOS apps. So before then, they just basically taken the the mobile version of their HTML site and served that up in like a little you know thin native wrapper called it a mobile app. But everyone hated it because it was slow and not native feeling. And so they're like, okay, we got to rewrite everything in you know Objective C and in Java so that our apps are fast and so on and so forth. Because they could see that you know everything was moving to mobile, and you know they needed to have like the best mobile experience possible, which you know then and still is like you know, building with native code. And so anyways, as they started doing that, they all of a sudden they're like, oh, like this is now, like anyways, a big question was like, oh, like data fetching. Cause you know, with their, 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 you know, their web stack, they had all these like optimizations around like their PHP or hack. They're kind of their PHP variant uh, hack language for, you know, pulling the data into templates and so forth. But you know, that and, and that was like all a server rendered piece, but when you move to native, you now have like a client server architecture where, you know, the client, the native client is like doing like API calls to the server to get data. And anyway, so it's like when you have like server rendered stuff, you know, everything is working within the same data center. And so you can make lots of cheap requests uh, Mm -hmm. to get data. But when you have a client server architecture, your client is who knows where it's at and who knows how bad the, the network connection is between it and the server. And so requests to the server are now very expensive potentially. Look for a job more efficiently with Indeed Prime. Indeed Prime flips the job search model and lets you find a job more efficiently even while you're busy with other engineering work or coding your side project. You simply upload your resume, and in one click, you get immediate exposure to companies like Facebook, Uber, and Dropbox. The employers that are interested will reach out to you within one week with salary, position, and equity up front. Don't let applying for jobs become a full-time job itself. With Indeed Prime, the jobs come to you. The average software developer gets five employer contacts and an average salary offer of $125,000 through Indeed Prime. It's 100% free for candidates. There are no strings attached. Sign up now at Indeed.com slash SE Daily. Thank you to Indeed Prime for being a repeat sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. And if you want to support the show while looking for a new job, go to Indeed.com slash SE Daily. Yeah, so I'll give it my explanation for why I think this is interesting is if you're using, if you have to make, so GraphQL is really good at pulling in a lot of different data, disparate data sources and, uh-huh. and collating that data and turning those dis- disparate data sources into a, a nice user experience because, and, and many user experiences have data that's pulled in from lots of different databases. I mean, if, if you're, you know, using Facebook, probably when you load your page, there's, 10 different databases that are being accessed. You've got some image database, user yeah. databases, comments databases. And if I have to load my web page and a GraphQL, uh, this big GraphQL query is making these client-side requests on, on my phone or on my desktop computer to all of these different data sources, to all these different databases, then my web page is just going to block until all that information loads. Mm-hmm. But if it's able to make all that all those requests somehow before the page loads, then it's going to be a lot snappier because all of that work is going to be done on the server side, and you're going to have a lot more predictable routing behavior on the server side. It's going to be snappier, and so you're just going to get more performance. And what you're doing is you're pushing that notion to build time for static websites. So if you've got mm-hmm. the static website that you want to serve to somebody, that you that is nonetheless going to pull information from lots of different areas. Like if you're building a uh, some some website that pulls in all the beef recipes across the internet, and it's able to just yeah. you know get get you all the best beef recipes uh, across the internet, and it pulls it in from recipes.com and you know all these different data sources that have various different loading speeds. You know, you'd be able to do that with GraphQL. Uh, at any layer of the stack, but what you're saying is let's push it to build time, so we get all mm-hmm. that information at build time. 
we we throw it into a static website and then the website's going to load really really snappy yeah 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 that, that's a really good explanation yeah so it's definitely like yeah there's two two reasons the graphql is really nice the performance one is like one that people talk about the most because it's like a really big deal on mobile and gatsby's usage is a very big deal too because yeah, through Gatsby's GraphQL slash plugin system, you can like basically hook up, you know, you basically pull in data from anywhere. And, you know, however long it takes to pull in, you can do that all at build time so that when you're actually serving the page, like you said, it's like extremely fast. The other big part of it, though, re- returning real quick to the, the, like the Facebook you know, origin story is, you know, Facebook, when they were switching to, to native mobile, it's like their APIs were just like a mess. Like they just had like tons of them, you know, that built at different stages and like literally like dozens of different APIs to get all the data, you know, needed for everything. And, you know, they had inconsistencies around like how you access them and like, you know, what the signatures for different things was and this and that and the other thing. And so GraphQL was a basically a way to like wrap all of that, you know, mess and something that was like very clean and consistent and like product centric. So it was like, it makes sense to, you know, product UI developers. And so Gatsby's, you know, use of GraphQL also has that effect where, you know, you look at all the, all, all the possible, you know, sources of data <laughs> in the world and there's like an enormous complexity there. There's just like so many different ways of doing it and so many different like options for like, you know, how you can like query data and like how it's presented and the form it's in and so on and so forth. And so by wrapping that all in like a uniform kind of like interface, that means that, you know, as a, you know, someone wanting to build a site, you can basically just say, oh, I want to plug in for that data source and that data source and that data source. And then it's all presented to you in the same way that you can like query and do stuff with, um, which I think is, you know, a really big deal. So let's say I wanted to build that website that pulls in all the best beef recipes <laughs> around the internet, and I've got a bunch of different data sources. I've got recipes.com, I've got beefhits.com, you know, foodporn.org, all these different sites. And but I want to, I want them to be up to date. Like if somebody po- posts a new recipe for beef stroganoff on foodporn.org. I want to make sure that I get that into my the most recent build of my website. So, right. so what's the workflow for? So, if I've got this, you know, static site that's going to be generated on a server somewhere, and then it gets pushed to S3, for example, and then uh-huh. it's served to me from S3. Like, am I just am I just updating the the static website on a regular basis? Do I just like rebuild it every you know fifteen minutes or something? Yeah, that would totally work. For something like mm-hmm. this where you don't control the data source, you just you just rebuild it as often as you care to have the latest information, which is, you know, domain specific. But more 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 often when you're building stuff with Gatsby and a kind of remote data source, like you're you know, you're controlling that data. Like you you're 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 using some sort of service, you know, that you kind of control. So there's a lot of like hosted CMSs these days, like CMSs as a service, where you know you have kind of like a WordPress esque you know interface for like editing, adding, editing content, but all they offer then is like an API, like how you build the websites up to you. And so something like that, you know, you would want to rebuild the website, you know, the Gatsby website every time you add a new whatever, you know, add a new recipe or add a new you know post or you know whatever. And they they generally have like web hooks that then you would trigger a build automatically every time you update the content and so you like you know Mm. go there and you're like oh there's a typo and you edit it you click save and then you know 30 seconds a minute later it's live on the internet Hmm. so this is a really interesting model what i'm I'm not sure where to go from here there's a lot of different directions we could go but actually the the thing i'm most curious about is what your like big vision is are you going to turn this into a business of some sort or what's your what's like the the most grandiose version of (laughs) <laughs> uh, what Gatsby turns into. Yeah, so the most grandiose is that, you know, in a few years, a big percentage of the internet's running on Gatsby. And I think, I mean, I'd love to, yeah, so I'd, I'd love to like, you know, I'd love to keep working on Gatsby as long as it makes sense. And so I think the best way to do that is to create some sort of business around it. I haven't done that yet. I've been exploring lots of options. But yeah, that's my plan to figure out something there. I'm, I'm sure you're studying the WordPress model. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, it's like, it's kind of a funny problem, though, because like open source, you don't, it, it, anyways, it's tricky to make money off open source. And so the best, the most reliable way of making money is if your product is wildly successful. 
And then even at the worst, you know, then there's like consulting and other stuff around it. Um, yes. <laughs> at the worst. Uh, it's not really. Anyways. Yeah. So that's kind of like my initial goal is just to like make Gatsby mm-hmm. as amazing as possible. And so there'll be lots of people adopting it. And then, you know, if Gatsby's really big, then, you know, there's plenty of ways to make money off it. Hmm. Given the kind of like, be- the, okay, so let's take the recipes example a little bit further. So if I wanted to have a login component on the website, that's a little more of what I would consider dynamic system. Like I log in and then maybe there's some 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 different stuff that low like I want it I want it to work such that when I log in maybe I have a feed of recipes that appeal uh-huh. to me. That sounds like something that would not work so well with with what we would consider a static website. So how would you know what would be the model for if I wanted to have a a, a, a site that did that in Gatsby, what would I do? Yeah, so if you want like a logged in experience, then you basically treat it like any sort of web app that people build, you know, now. And that's actually an interesting property of Gatsby is that you can have both, you, you can have Gatsby sites that blend kind of site and app paradigms uh, really easily. So, I mean, I know there's, I mean, there's already several people, companies out there that I've, and I've helped directly, so there's probably more than I don't know about that are using Gatsby. They're like SaaS companies. Uh, so they're building their entire marketing sites and SaaS applications all in Gatsby. And so the marketing portions are all, you know, completely, you know, server rendered and, you know, just served as HTML and so on and so forth. But, you know, once you load and you click like log in, then you like immediately jump into the web app portion where you're hitting their API and so on and so forth. And what's really cool about that is that it's like this really seamless, like from user experience, it's like a really seamless you know, experience. You have some goals with Gatsby, some high level goals, speed, cost, and an ability to be used by people around the globe, the next billion internet users. How do those goals fit into implementation decisions in Gatsby? Yeah, I mean, good engineering is good engineering to some extent. So, I mean, well engineered software, it's like, it's fast, it's bug free. It does what you expect. It's intuitive, you know, which generally means consistent and familiar based on other stuff that you've used. So, yeah, so I, I think the main thing is, you know, build good software, which, you know, it, it, so, so, so it builds good software, well, you know, which is like the same as, you know, building any other good tool. But more than that is, you know, really understand where the web is going and build for that target. You know, kind of like skate where the, the, the puck is going. Because I think that's an underappreciated, you know, underappreciated thing right now. It's just like how much the web has changed in the last, you know, 10 years and even like five years. And anyways, and I think a lot of people are, are kind of waking up to that. But, you know, for the most part, you know, we're still using older tools, which to some extent, you know, can be, you know, like to some extent can be upgraded. But I, I don't think entirely so. Yeah, I mean something like WordPress. I think I feel like WordPress is really starting to show its age mm-hmm. in some places, and you can I mean, you can do plenty of things to uh, amp up the performance. But I think part of the problem is that there's this huge ecosystem of plugins around mm-hmm. WordPress, and that was great for a really long time. But now, like if you've got an out, if you've got a, a a website that has the most recent version of WordPress, which is really nice and performant. But it's uh-huh. got 15 plugins that are not performant, and the 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 maintainer of the plugin is long since cashed in and left the building. <laughs> yeah, you know it's kind of unavoidable uh, issues, and like half the yeah half the inter- internet runs on WordPress, and I think that's fantastic. But uh, it's kind of a pro- it's, that seems like a problematic ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, and, and they got lots of life in them. You know, it's 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 not like they they. WordPress sites are great in a lot of ways. For sure. But, oh yeah. Hey, listen. My my website runs on <laughs> software uh, software engineering daily runs on WordPress. So in some sense, I'm biting the hand that feeds me. Yeah. But if you are like, but yeah, if you are if you are saying I'm building a new site or I'm doing a significant rebuild, I think many people are starting to say, you know, why why choose WordPress at this point? But both because of like you know dating tool like the the tools are getting dated the lack of easy integration, you know, with like modern JavaScript and CSS. And I think the biggest thing is it's just server, 
like the biggest the biggest thing that Gatsby takes advantage of and that WordPress and any, any other you know older tool doesn't is they're server driven that if you click on a link nothing happens until the server responds generally speaking you can get around that with you know sufficient effort but that that's kind of like the built-in assumption of WordPress and Drupal and Joomla and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And mm. the problem with that is, you know, it just ignores the reality that most, like the majority, I think even in most, you know, first world countries of browsing time on websites is done on a smartphone. And smartphones are awesome, but smartphones are also frequently on bad network connections. Um, and if your website basically can't operate, like by itself, at, at times when it's kind of like disconnected from the mothership, you know, then the experience is going to frequently feel kind of like choppy. Where you like, as of course, anyone, anyone, you know, anyone listening has experience, you know, you like click on something and then it just kind of breaks or sits around, you know, waiting for something to happen, reach around waiting for something to happen. Where Gatsby is like, you know, what's like, it started to become the most popular way of describing this. It's a, it's a universal JavaScript framework, meaning that. Basically, when you load a Gatsby site, you are downloading a kind of like a little mini JavaScript application that can work by itself in your browser. And so if you're on a smartphone, you hit a Gatsby site, it does first like optimize, you know, it downloads just the stuff for that initial page so that it like loads as fast as possible. But it immediately then starts prefetching resources for other pages that you know are linked to from that initial page and possibly other stuff in the site as well. And so as you click around, you know, you're kind of like pulling in, you know, different sections of the site. And anyways, and so all that stuff is running just on your browser and you can like click around. So even if you go offline, you can still keep clicking around and, you know, view content and like do interactive stuff and so on and so forth. And and then you just get that by default um, with Gatsby because, you know, that's Gatsby's built for 2017, which is, you know, it, I think any website that wants to be performant and widely usable needs to, to work this way. So I know we're basically at the end of our time, but I, you know, I had one, there's one more question I really wanted to ask because, you know, progressive web apps are kind of hand, the hand in hand with Gatsby. You know, you can, uh -huh. you can easily turn your Gatsby website into progressive web app. There was this, I think this thing that trended on Hacker News or on Twitter or something right. yesterday that was like, Apple is destroying the internet by <laughs> not supporting progressive web apps i didn't read it but it was one of these things where like okay cool like i get the sentiment from the headline i'm not even gonna, i don't need to read it like some blog post and you know i kind of get that like just just i just have to read the headline there and I mean, i'm sure that the article is worth checking out but the sentiment is 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 worth thinking about because you know apple apps are are beautiful and performant and i have an iphone and i'm not sure i will be abandoning the ios ecosystem with my next phone especially given the ar stuff that's coming but yeah do you agree with that sentiment or to what degree do you agree with it that you know by not you know by having this ecosystem where there's not really a way to do progressive web apps you know apple is hobbling the world so i agree and disagree well no I, I progressively agree, <laughs> I guess you could say. Uh, so first, like, I definitely am annoyed at Safari for not, you know, the people at Safari for not working on service workers. I actually have a couple friends that work on the Safari team, and so every time I see them, I'm like, hey, when's uh, service worker shipping? <laughs> so, so far, they haven't said anything. But uh, I, I think, like, the main... So the thing about progressive web apps is it is progressive, so... You know, service worker, not, not supporting service worker only hobbles some of the use cases of a progressive web app, you know, as Google defines it. Mainly, which is like true offline support in that you can be offline and, you know, you hit a, you hit a, a, an app button thingy on your phone and it loads the site and everything just works. So not, not supporting service workers does mean that that experience is broken on iOS, but that doesn't affect Gatsby necessarily as much because most of the time, you know, it, it's actually, so, so Gatsby site can work offline, which is like really cool, with like on Android or on like, you know, Chrome on the desktop or whatever, something that supports service workers. But most of the time it's like, you know, when you visit a website, you're online and that's kind of the expectation. And I don't think there's too many, uh, there's not tons and tons of use cases for wanting to like consume content truly offline. There is certainly some, but it, it's anyways, but 
Gatsby still has a lot of stuff built in that makes it really fast, even without service workers. From Gatsby's perspective, service workers are like an optimization more than a must have to be fast. I mean, basically, if you're not familiar with like service workers, service workers are a programmatic proxy, basically. So they, they sit between your browser and the server and they intercept every request the browser makes and they can decide to do something about that request or not. And so what's cool about that is, you know, one, one of the, I mean, you can do lots of things, but one of the coolest parts and like most, you know, relevant parts is that it can like cache things in a really smart way on the client. And so, you know, normally if you're requesting a bunch of stuff and like you'd have to go out to the server and download it all, whatever, you can like put them in the service worker cache instead. And so, you know, instead of waiting, you know, a second or two or something like that to download something, you come back in like 20 milliseconds. And so the perceived performance of your site can be much faster, but it also enables like this offline uh, use case because even if you're offline, the programmatic proxy, the service worker can intercept requests and still return. And your browser can feel like, oh, everything's normal because I'm still talking to my proxy and things are working. But anyway, so so Gatsby, because Gatsby like prefetches stuff, like that works regardless of whether you're, you know, talking to this programmatic proxy or not. And so Gatsby is very fast on iOS. And if you have a service worker, you know, and you're on Android, then it's even faster. So yeah, so I definitely will hope that, you know, Safari ships it soon. But I think Gatsby is like an excellent choice, uh, regardless of, you know, whether Safari ever supports it or not. All right. Well, Kyle, thanks for going over time, and I am really fascinated by Gatsby. I, I'm looking forward to seeing what develops in the future. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it's been really fun to ride so far. Simplify continuous delivery with GoCD, the on-premise, open-source, continuous delivery tool by ThoughtWorks. With GoCD, you can easily model complex deployment workflows using pipelines, and visualize them end-to-end -end with the value stream map. You get complete visibility into and control over your company's deployments. At gocd.org slash sedaily, find out how to bring continuous delivery to your teams. Say goodbye to deployment panic and hello to consistent, predictable deliveries. Visit gocd.org slash sedaily to learn more about GoCD. Commercial support and enterprise add-ons, including disaster recovery, are available. Thanks to GoCD for being a continued sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Wow!